Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 382, featuring part three of my interview with the fantastic Bob Clardy. In this part of the interview, we talk about his games A War in Middle Earth, uh, we talk about Dexter, we talk about Spirit of, Ex <laughs> Spirit of Excalibur, uh, what it was like working with uh, Jack Tramiel and Ken Williams of Sierra. Uh, we also talk about the uh, great video game Crash and much, much more. This is a lot of... Uh, a really good stuff in this episode. I know you guys will enjoy it. So without further ado, here is Mr. Bob Clardy. I hadn't thought about a lot of this stuff in a while, and I hadn't read the the uh, CR, CRPG Addict in ages. I had to go back and look at that again. It's very, <laughs> he's very detailed. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he definitely uh, plays the games <laughs> thoroughly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love his work. I... Yeah, I saw you'd actually commented on a few of his. Uh, I, I did on several uh, of those, Dungeon Wilderness and maybe Odyssey, but I don't. I haven't looked at it since those comments. That was quite some time back. I don't remember when that was. Several years ago, at least. Well, let's move forward a little bit. I want to get into this. You've already mentioned sort of this transition to Sierra. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you'd also sent me another note about Jungle Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jungle Hunt was a good story. Well, yeah. was that connected at all to the Sierra stuff, or is this a totally different story? Totally different story, and it's what started us um, down the path of becoming a developer as opposed to a publisher. Um, the uh, you want me to dive in? You ready to go? Yeah, let's back up. So, <laughs> where does this okay. Jungle Hunt story start? Where? Nineteen eighty two. Okay. Nineteen eighty two. Okay. We had. Sometime in there, I think it was, I think I mentioned it was like around 1980 that I did my first Atari 800 game, and at that point, uh, and we did a few other uh, um, games on other systems in those days. But I realized that I wasn't known in the industry as an Atari publisher, and so I wasn't selling them very well. So I was looking for publishers to partner with that that covered other computers, somebody with a bigger name than us. So. Um, in the early days of our business, when we went to uh, game developer conferences and um, uh, the West Coast Computer Fair was the first one I went to, but then there was the Computer Game Developers Conference and some others. When we went to those, we had a booth where we would expect customers to come by and see us. We stopped that fairly early because uh, really we wanted connections with other publishers that we could work with, that we could you know, do joint operations with. So uh, in the later shows that we went to, we would visit their booths and it was in uh, i think it was in 82 that i visited atari's booth and learned that they were starting a new division called atari soft right. now before then atari had two sides there was the coin op side and there was the vcs side the the game machine side and they they were doing cartridge games for the uh, atari vcs and atari 2600 and whatever else was around in those days and they were doing huge numbers. Um, I had a friend I knew in college, uh, a guy named Warren Robinette that worked there. Oh yeah, the adventure guy. The adventure guy. Yeah. Warren was uh, he was my tutor. Easter, Easter my, egg guy. <laughs> he was the first guy. Yeah, and I and I didn't realize I didn't hear about the Easter egg until later. If I had known about that Easter egg and why he did it. I, I might have had a little more, a bit, been a little bit more leery about Atari because apparently the reason he put it put the Easter egg in the game was that you were not allowed if you worked for Atari you were not allowed to have your name on anything. It was Atari was the only name that counted. So Warren Robinette's name did not show up in that game unless you s stumbled upon his Easter egg. So, but I didn't know that at the time. I just knew, hey, I had a buddy that works there and his game sold a million copies, and. You know, gee, that was, you know, salivating. You know, you just, <laughs> whoa, that's great. I got to work with these guys. So I was uh, interested in, in doing something with them. We went, and what they were doing at this time in 82 was, I um, mean, they've been doing extremely well in the video game business, and uh, they wanted to expand all the home computers. So they were hiring developers to, do, to port their games to a bunch of different systems. So uh, we contracted to do... 
Jungle Hunt to the IBM PC, the Apple, and the VIC-20. That's one of my and, favorite arcade games. <laughs> really? Yeah, was, I love was, that game. It was, it was a cute game. It was a cute game. And then we were, then we had pole position and track and field, and I think we were doing Donkey Kong Jr. on something. So oh, wow. we had we had a bunch of games, and um, and they wanted finished manufactured goods. Some of which, like the Vic Twenty stuff, was on cartridges. Those were expensive to manufacture. So we had this was a multi million dollar contract. This was a complete change for us. We had been you know dealing with really small numbers before this, and we were being um, uh, offered the opportunity to step into the big time. And, you know, this was our first chance to do that. And we were really excited and thought this was the greatest thing ever, but we couldn't begin to afford this. Uh, well, it required two things that we didn't have. One is, uh, manufacturing capability. I couldn't afford, so I took out a bank loan for that. And, uh, we needed to be able to program on a whole bunch of computers, some of which I'd never even seen before, like the VIC 20. I wasn't that familiar with. I mean, I'd heard about it, but I'd never seen one. And the IBM PC, we'd never done PC work before this. So we had to hire new people and train them and buy equipment. And we needed a bigger office. We had to move. We spent a lot of money that year. And uh, it was going well. We had finished a couple of the games and made deliveries. Uh, but that was in 82. And 83 is when we were shipping. So we were, we were making our deliveries in 83. 83 was... Um, that was the year of the big video game crash. Uh, that was the year that it was in December of 82 that Atari uh, so, uh, launched E.T. the Extraterrestrial, <laughs> the worst game ever. Hell, yeah. Howard Scott Warshaw. That story. And uh, that happened in you know December of 82. So 83 is when the crash was happening. You know, the, the whole industry was reeling in bafflement that, hey, these things don't just automatically oh, yeah. sell. And the parent company was Time Warner at the time. And uh, Time Warner decided, you know, this was a bust. Let's, you know, bail you know, quick. And so they sold off the Atari Soft division. Um, and Jack Tremail was the guy. Jack Tremail was a, an executive at Commodore who uh, bought Atari at that time. And, or bought Atari Soft anyway. I, I guess he had a lot of Atari because he, he, he did the Atari ST stuff later. Anyway. Uh, but Tremail came in, and um, he was a different kettle of fish than uh, the prior uh, executives. They, um, uh, he considered, you know, winning the game was all that mattered. Business is war. That was his slogan. Business uh, is war. <laughs> business is war. Wow. And if you are not immediately useful to him today, then you are the enemy. So any he he reneged on all the contracts. He refused to pay for things that had been delivered. Uh, he basically, his, his, pro, his procedure at the time, and I learned later this was, you know, he did this, he'd been doing this for years. His procedure was, you do anything you want and then see who will sue you and then you stall them in court and see who dies and, and then you settle with the survivors because it's cheaper than, you know, paying up oh, front. What a, what a pleasant guy. <laughs> he was wonderful, wonderful to work with. So, yeah, we were... Um, He's been referred to as Attila the Hunt. It's like working with Attila the Hunt. Well, that's I, who you're <laughs> that, He's Attila the Hunt, Jack Tremail. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but again, that was, that's been quoted elsewhere. It's, it's not original to me. This was just, I was there during part of it. And this was our first big opportunity to get big. And at the end of it, we settled. We managed to survive. A lot of the other companies that I was working with, a lot of the other developers I got to know during that process, uh, died. They went out of business during that. And I'll tell you about serious software in a minute. They were, they were related, but not quite. But anyway, we survived, we survived, we settled, we got a, a tiny fraction of what we had been expecting, but we got enough to pay back the bank loan. And we, we'd been taking loans from, um, uh, key employees as well, uh, shorting people on paychecks. We worked out agreements. If you, you know, you'd get, more back if you can stall six months. And so anybody that could afford to wait gave, we had a really close knit office and they all chipped in. And, um, so we had a settlement large enough to pay back everybody, but us, um, wow. my wife and myself, we took a year of no pay and, and managed to just barely, barely survive that year. 
This must so, have been especially uh, devastating given that you were anticipating a huge windfall, right? Yes, and it and, and and that wasn't the worst problem, really. I mean that that was uh, that was a huge problem, but the worst problem was that it completely changed the nature of our business. We had been a self-publisher before that, and now we were a contract developer. I'd hired people, I'd bought equipment, I had new friends. We'd all gone through this this ordeal together. You know, I could not let these people go just because we were getting screwed. So, um we had to hurry and go out and find new contracts because I needed a completely different business model at this point, and it changed everything. Uh, it, it had its good sides, and there was a lot of a lot of good games after that. But I never got to write my games anymore because now I had this this uh, organization that I had to support, and uh, I did completely different kind of work. I was out hustling contracts and negotiating you know with with other publishers and they came and went so fast in those days there were so many that we worked with that didn't survive and it was uh it was a chaotic time period i mentioned briefly uh serious software that was a serious software was another co- publisher that um we worked fairly intimately with jerry jewell is still around you mm. i don't know if you've interviewed him yet oh, not he, yet. he's a good candidate talk to jerry he's fun uh, but but he employed uh, uh, Nasser Gabelli, and they they were in '82. They were doing extremely well. We almost merged with them, but both of us were we were doing our deal with Atari, and they were doing a similar deal with 20th Century Fox. And the, both of us thought this was the deal that was going to break us, you know, into the big time. And so we decided to put off any talks about mergers until we saw the deals worked out. And they both blew up in our faces. <laughs> So the same 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 thing happened to Sirius Software. Twentieth Century Fox stiffed them on deliveries, and but they went out of business. So eighty three was the end of that company. That's too so. bad. I, I could just, I could see the title now. The Sirius Synergy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like it. It does yeah. sound good. That, that sounds good, doesn't it? It does. I that is it's it's really. I mean, you must have just. I can't even imagine the, the how much how gloomy this must have been and. And depressing, and then uh, it, it was a rough time. It was a rough time. We had a. Did you work for Sierra after? When did this? Uh, uh, yeah, shortly after that. Um, we. Uh, I don't know how much time we have. To, uh, there's two, two two of the big stories between uh, Sierra and uh, and Atari, but you know, I, we could just jump straight to Sierra because that's a long enough story itself. How much time do you want to take? Uh, however long. I don't have any time limits. Okay, before we get to Sierra, there's there's the intervening years. There was uh, a lot of other publishers that we worked with, some of which worked out pretty nicely. Uh, Mastertronic was a was a big publisher. Oh yeah, Mastertronic. Yeah, I got some. And there's some stories there that are worth worthwhile, and it all kind of the gaming side of it all ended with Sierra. So that was the final story. And it was a complicated story too, but there's so a lot. S- we can save that for for the end. Then. Okay. Well, so the intervening years were, uh, you know, we're suddenly scrambling to find publishers. Initially, um, I went to the, you know, the the uh, consumer electronics shows, the the uh, all, all of the game shows, all of the shows for uh, software developers and publishers. Met as many people as I could, and I put it pretty much just took anything I can get. And so we did jobs with companies that I can't even remember the names of nowadays, but. Uh, did a lot of lot of quickie jobs. Uh, we were, our group was um, very fast, so we could do ports. We had a lot of in-house tools that we had developed to make ports work faster. We had uh, good art staff that could say, "Okay, we this machine has a 256 color palette, and the machine we're going to has a uh, some you know something different. We know how to deal with that." And they would crank out the stuff very quickly. Uh, but mainly, we were just fast. So we would take, you know, three, four, six month jobs, crank them out. It, they're off being published, and we've got a new one starting up the next day. So I was constantly looking for new publishers and working with them. And some worked. You know, some would lead to sequels. Some, you know, were one shots that died quickly and uh, were as quickly forgotten. Uh, Mastertronic was one that came along fairly early in that process, and we started doing more and more work for them. We almost became part of the Mastertronic empire. They were collecting companies, too. Um, Sierra did this later, but uh, Mastertronic was doing it at the time I met them. They were buying... Uh, they were originally a, a, a British company, 
And in England, they had a whole bunch of labels. They felt that uh, as a publisher, they could get more shelf space if they looked like six publishers. <laughs> so that was their theory. And some of these were, you know, cheapo, you know, known for, you know, $10 games and others were $50 games. And so they wanted to keep those labels separate. So they had separate labels for everything. And they pretended they were many well, companies. You know, it, make, it makes sense. It does. It does. And they were good at it. But they did consider it was my first... Uh, awareness of um, of a company that considered developers to be disposable commodities. Mm. That you know, you went and bought another one, you used it. If this label became contaminated, you just flushed all those people and get, got a different group. So it was uh, something I ran into repeatedly, and it was it, it was part of what led to the chaos in the industry that uh, there wasn't a lot of long term security for some of these companies. They they sprang up. They had their moment in the sun, and they were gone two years later. And it was just, uh, it was uh, kind of baffling, kind of scary, kind of, but it was just chaotic. It, it was just chaotic. But um, the nice thing about working with uh, Mastertronic was they would tend to go get uh, licenses. They would do their first version in Europe on, on really cheap machines, you know, uh, like the ZX and ZX, that was the one I was trying to remember. Yeah, you know these these little these cheap machines that were you know expecting to have cheap software, and so they had you know fairly budget games that really wouldn't sell well in the United States, particularly not on the IBM PC or the Macintosh. Some of the nicer the the Amiga, these nicer and more expensive systems are expecting much better games. So when Mastertronic did some games like the the first one we did uh, that that comes to mind, we've done several games by them, but the first big one was. Uh, War in Middle Earth. Uh, when they got that license, they did a really crappy game in Europe. I, it, it was ported to the Commodore 64. They brought that over to the United States, tried to sell it. It sold very poorly. And then they hired us to do some ports. And we convinced them that ports would be devastating. That You know, you put that on, uh, on a more expensive system and it's just going to die. So they agreed. We persuaded them to to do a more ambitious development effort and let us write up an all new game, and we did. And we went back to writing my genreless games. The you know the, our version of War in Middle Earth was was a game that you could play it as a war game, you could play it as a role playing game, you could play it as an adventure game. I played that and, one a lot on my Amiga. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, it was a it was an memories. It was a good. I thought it was a good game, uh, and it had some features in it that. Nobody saw all the things that it did. There were there were features that uh, I mean, it had a uh, it had a map level where things moved fairly quickly from location to location, and a scene level when when you have an encounter, you went to the scene level, and you have uh, an interaction with an enemy. You'd have a fight, you'd have a conversation, you'd have a, a transaction of some sort. But the thing that people didn't really know is that. Uh, every pixel on the map would generate a unique scene that was suitable for that location on the map. So if there were mountains nearby, you'd see mountains in the background. And if you were in the woods, you'd see trees. And we would build a scene based on that location. Well, you could stay in the scene level if you wanted and just walk off the edge of the scene and it would go to the next pixel on the map. And you could walk across all of Middle Earth and it would be as boring a game as... Um, <laughs> As living that adventure real time would have been so, <laughs> so, so that was in there. Talking there himself, I go on for two chapters, right, with the same sort of scenery description. I could up. There were people that did that, <laughs> but the more, but the more important thing, what the the other one that we intended though was that you could play it as a war game, and that worked really well. Uh, and again, I think most people didn't discover that. Most people thought, "Hey, I know the." Lord of the Rings storyline. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to get the hobbits and the elves and the dwarves and the wizards together, and we're going to go on this adventure and destroy the ring. That's the, that's the game. That I know that story, and that worked. We made sure that worked. But there were other people that played it as a war game. You would get, you'd go to the Council of Elrond, and you'd have all these people there, and instead of forming a fellowship, you'd say, "Okay, uh, Gimli, the dwarf, you go off to the Iron Hills and recruit." You know your cousin there, and bring us an army. And uh, Legolas, you go go talk to the elves and bring us an army. And they could do that. They would do that. They all scattered to their their separate realms and come back with armies. And you come and meet the forces of Sauron with a humongous army. And some people played it that way. And uh, there was one that we we maybe should have taken out, but I liked it so much. 
that I left it in there. Um, that our testers ran into that found that the, the fastest way to win that game was to send Frodo off by himself with no help. I mean, Gandalf would, would Gandalf, the game starts with Gandalf talking to Frodo and telling him what needs to happen. And Gandalf texts Frodo to take him to the uh, Council of Elrond. Forget that. First thing you do is tell, tell Gandalf, head off to Moria and get killed. Let's get Gandalf out of the way. <laughs> okay. Second thing is Frodo heads off, you know, uh, to wherever he starts going to, the, uh, the Prancing Pony and uh, Bree or someplace, whatever, wherever he starts. Anyway, he runs into a Nazgul on horseback and gets killed. And the Nazgul takes the ring and heads off to Mordor with the ring. That's the start of the of the game. Uh, now, what happens, though, is that when Gandalf gets killed, Gandalf the Grey gets killed, he's resurrected as Gandalf the White, who comes back and shows up in Fanghorn Forest, way over on the other side of Middle-earth. And uh, he's already now really close to Mount Doom, and Gandalf the White is a much stronger character than Gandalf the Grey. Gandalf the White can kill Nazgul. He's, he's that strong. So he then heads off to Mount Doom and sits there waiting for this, this Nazgul on horseback who's got the ring to make his way across the whole map. And eventually he gets to more, to uh, Mount Doom. Gandalf kills him and throws the ring in. And that <laughs> went. And you skip the whole friggin' game. It's somehow not as epic of an adventure. No, it's not. <laughs> and, and you've got to kill all your best characters at the start. And, and it's just... But it was a way that we could test the end of the game, so we left it in there because we, we had a lot of end game stuff that we wanted to test, so we just left that one in there. I don't know that anybody found it. Point was, this was another instance of my uh, efforts, uh, in this case, the the, uh, the other lead designers on this, uh, Alan Clark and uh, Mike Brightham, some of the other people that were on it, had the same feeling that we wanted the player to make their game, so we... We set up an environment, we set up characters, we set up forces, and we let the player do what they want. And sometimes they did some strange things. That was fun. You know, that was fun for them. And they found things that we didn't intend. That was good, too. And they can play the game again if they want to come back and, and play what we had intended. But it's up to them. <laughs> So, anyway, you had Graham Devine on that team. At some capacity. Graham Devine, yeah, that was back before he kind of started all of his own stuff. He worked on it with us. Uh, he was at Mastertronic Corporate. There, he didn't work in our office. He was the art director at Mastertronic, and uh, he did, you know, sample art and said, "Okay, this is what the look's going to be," and he'd send us some stuff, and then our artists would, would follow that lead and develop that look. He, he was he was a good guy, good guy to work with. I'm just looking back there. I thought I might have a copy of the game. Um, Not seeing it. No, that's or, another, it's Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I got it around here somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I had to find that. Well, anyway, uh, Mastertronic got us two things at that point. That game did fairly well for them. I don't know how well, but it, it did. They were pleased. So they let us do... Um, other fantasy adventures, we did uh, Spirit of Excalibur for them, Vengeance of Excalibur, that. eventually we did Conan. And each of these were, they were, they were all, you know, big games for us, but they were also all done on a whole bunch of computers. There were seven or eight versions of each of them uh, that came out simultaneously. So that was, again, something that Synergistic could do because of, you know, where we had been left after the Atari stuff. But... Uh, not that many other development houses did that in those days. So when you were you know, doing so, that, was <clears throat> was the goal to try to make sort of each version as close to the same, like one sort of master version? Was the idea more let's let's exploit whatever these individual systems are good at? The latter, um, but uh, uh, certainly the art and sound had to be the best that that system could do. So in some cases, we did completely new art. Most of the time, we ported the art, and then we'd start with the highest-end systems. Like, we always did use the Amiga for the original art. And then you would do the IBM PC art by simplifying and grossly corrupting the, the, the pretty Amiga stuff down to, this, okay, we need a VGA version or something, you know, for color. Ugh. But, you know, you did, we did versions uh, down from the top system. But, yes, each system was supposed to be as good as it could be. Uh, the... Uh, what was it? The um, we had a, that was our first CD-ROM game was uh, Spirit of Excalibur on the CD TV, which oh, is an the CD TV. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that really well, took it, off. 
you know, it, you know, it, it was a really cool system. I wish it had, but so we had, uh, you know, we were doing voice work on that one, and um, it was it was definitely optimized for that one system. No other system could do all those things. So, yeah, but the game itself, the playability was the same on all of them. Uh, the, the you know where you went, how long it took to play, what you did, those were the same. So that was uh, Mastertronic. Uh, the, I think the last game, well, we did Conan with them, and there was a sequel to Conan. I think it was called Heroes of Legend, which really sucked. <laughs> uh, it, that was the last game. Uh, I just what was I so sucked about it? Uh, it was a decent game, but um, it wasn't. It didn't have the mythos and the the history of Conan, for instance. It was meant to be a sequel to Conan, but. Um, but we didn't have a Conan character. We didn't have a... So it was more generic and more puzzle-based. The uh, uh, the scene level was, you know, you'd wander around and have to figure out how to get through a city by, you know, getting up onto the walls and you'd navigate that maze and then you'd get into the buildings and navigate that maze. And it ended up being a little bit tedious as, a, as adventure games go, I think, because we had... It was way too puzzle-oriented. I, I wanted a puzzle game. It, 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 but but it was being sold to adventure game enthusiasts. That oh. was, you know, not the right market. So it was just, it, it just wasn't the right game. Anyway, that was about that was our roughly. I believe that was the last game we did with Mastertronic. At the same time, we were doing some games with Sierra Online. I think that's when we did Thexter. Oh yeah, that's uh, one of my favorites. Thexter. Love Thexter. Great game. Had a lot of fun with Thexter. So what's the story about Thexter? Um, Thexter was uh, a Japanese game. That was very well designed. There was this um, a robot that could turn into a small tank, or I think, and uh, it, basically it's a transformer type game. But again, it was a puzzle game. Uh, you you were going through a side scroller uh, tile like map, like a Mario Brothers type map, shooting out bricks and and working your way through. You have to find which bricks could be shot, and then drive through them to get to a new area and sh- uh, deal with all the all the flying attackers that were in the area very hard Point game. Is, a pardon <laughs> it's very difficult i don't think i ever got very far into it but <laughs> yeah i like i, I really liked it. it it had it had intricate puzzles it was a puzzle game and i could, it, I could it, hear the music even arcade now. game puzzle game so anyway we did we did the a port uh, of this original game to i think to the pc yeah it was pc and apple gs i think i wrote that one myself i played uh, it on the amiga yeah, it was on it was on several different systems, but anyway, it did well enough that Ken wanted to do um, an original version. I mean, a, a sequel, Thexter ninety five, which came out in ninety five for the Windows ninety five operating system, which was just being released at that time. He wanted a game that would come out on the new computer, and so we did a, a newer, bigger, you know, more complicated puzzles. We had. I don't go. I won't go into it, but it was a fun game to work on. I I think I wrote the level editor for that one. And built a lot of the levels, but I didn't actually write any of the game code on that one. So, anyway, that was uh, so as as Mastertronic was kind of winding up in our you know as our our lead publisher Sierra was kind of spooling up, and um, we were doing more and more stuff with Sierra. We've been doing we had another group in our office that, that had been doing sports simulations forever. Um, did sports simulations for Electronic Arts, and I don't remember all the companies, five or six of them, Sony and um, I think Time Warner, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so we started doing uh, sports simulations for Sierra along with uh, Thexter. So we, were, we had two divisions working with Sierra, and this was when Ken started his, hey, let's build Sierra up into something big enough to sell, and a time period, which again, I didn't realize was happening, but... I did realize they were get, they were becoming a bigger, stronger publisher. Uh, Ken was very good at uh, getting venture money and not being uh, sucked under. You know, a lot of a lot of the people in our in, in our industry would get venture money and then be destroyed a year later. They didn't uh, to produce proper returns, or they'd completely lose control of their company and have it taken over by people that didn't know the game industry. And uh, a lot of people that went that route didn't didn't survive. Ken was good at it and survived. So he, he had money, and they were building up um, 
building themselves up as a publisher that uh, uh, that could publish multiple, you know, multiple lines of products from different developers. So they began collecting development houses, Papyrus and Sublogic and Impressions and Us and Knowledge Adventure. And uh, eventually Blizzard got involved and uh, there was a whole bunch of them. And uh, it was it was getting bigger and bigger. And then but to me, I didn't care about too much of that other than what I cared about was uh, it was really easy to sell the jobs because I saw Ken Williams a fair amount. We were the of all the other uh, these other uh, developers, we were the closest uh, to where he lived. So I visited him often. He visited our offices and we talked a lot. And uh, he was a good guy to work with. Pleasant person. He, he, he was my kind of person. He was a. He was a gamer. He was a programmer. He was a businessman third. But he was just so much better at the business side of it than I was. So that was great. That's what I wanted. I didn't want the business side of it. So I wanted to partner up with somebody who would do that part. And he was willing. So um, this was just a, a good time for us. Um, but so we had an opportunity. What I didn't realize until later was that some of these companies that they were they were taking on, that they were joining with, uh, they were buying out at fairly, you know, good payments. Uh, we just kind of joined. Um, we had some stock options and a small amount of cash. And I said, okay, based on that, I will commit to only writing for Sierra. And we weren't really bought. We were, but we were, we were owned regardless. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the, I think the uh, fourth, maybe the uh, final installment of this interview. I uh, might have uh, two more, but I'm pretty sure it's the last one. So uh, at any rate, uh, stay tuned. Lots of great stuff coming up. I know you guys will enjoy. As always, I want to thank you, 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 thank you so very, very much for supporting uh, this show, Matt Chat, uh, keeping these episodes in production. Uh, remember, if you would like to support the show, just go to that link in the uh, show notes to the Patreon site. And a couple people were asking about a PayPal option. I don't know if you're aware of this, but you can go to the uh, mattchat.us site. And there's a couple of uh, PayPal options. You could set up a subscription with that or a uh, make just make a one-time uh, donation. I'll put a link to those in the show notes, too, just in case you don't want to go to that uh, Matt Chat site. But uh, either way, guys, I really appreciate it. Even if you just uh, comment on the show... Uh, Write a review of it somewhere, rate it, give it a thumbs up. Whatever you do, just know that I really appreciate your help uh, with the show. So thank you. Also, I want to welcome some new Ratrions. We've got Colonel RPG, Matt M., and Mark Garnett. Welcome to the pack, guys. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> All right, first up is a game on Steam. This is Galaxy of Pen and Paper. Now, this is a turn-based meta RPG about a group of uh, players rolling dice in the year 1999. Create your own game master RPG party as they role-play, explore distant planets in their imagination, fight aliens, and save the galaxy in the, area, in the era of dial-up internet and floppy disks. I mean, this is fantastic stuff. It's from uh, Behold Studios. That's so fourteen dollars and ninety nine cents on Steam right now. Uh, looks really definitely uh, worth uh, checking out at any rate. Uh, if you do play it, uh, let me know what you think. Love to hear from you. Uh, there's also a nice uh, twenty year retrospective of Diablo up. This is uh, by Costa Andreidis. 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 <laughs> Sounds uh, Greek. Uh, it's a nice beefy article. Lots of uh, quotes in there from developers and producers and all basically people that were involved somehow in the franchise. So. Uh, go check that out if you're up for some reading. And then Stig wrote in about this. This is a Cascade Quest, <laughs> an adventure of Cascadian proportions. Imagine that. Uh, in the spirit of classic graphic adventure games, Cascade Quest sends the player on an epic adventure through forests, mountains, and mysterious lairs on a mission of escape and retribution. Old school adventure game interface complete with a text parser. Hell yeah. And EGA Graphics, and that's uh, coming out in early 2018 for PC as well as the Mac. So 
Uh, thank you, uh, Stig, for sending that in. All right, what about that ale of the week? <laughs> uh, well, this week, I something caught my eye. I was over at World Market in, um, in the uh, Twin Cities area, and I found this uh, Stone's Original Ginger over in the L section. Now, this is a uh, product from the UK, I believe, uh, Guildford, uh, UK, Ac oh, there we go, Accolade Wines Limited out of Guildford, UK. It's 13.5% uh, by volume. Let's see, Stone's Original Ginger. Grape, w grape wine with sugar beet neutral spirits, natural ginger flavor, and caramel color. I'm really excited about that caramel color. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, contains sulfites. I guess, uh, what the hell's a sulfite? I don't know. Uh, to preserve freshness and taste, refrigerate after opening. Done. And let's see, product of England. So not a lot else here on the bottle. Anyway, I love ginger. Not sure what I'll think about this, but we, you know, why not? You gotta give it a shot, right? So let's uh, get this Stone's Original Ginger open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Stone's Original Ginger here in this really <laughs> rather fantastic drinking horn. Mm. <coughs> oh yeah, okay, let me try that again. Oh, I think I singed, singed some of my nose hairs on this. I feel kind of lightheaded just from sniffing this. It's got a, a definite, uh, <laughs> shall we say, uh, aromatic quality to it. You smell the ginger in there, sure enough. Uh, kind of a lemony, citrusy smell. <sighs> Not sure what else I'm smelling in there. Uh, it kind of smells like a, a little bit like Sprite uh, with some cranberry uh, juice mixed in. It's pretty pungent, but I wouldn't say it's a bad smell. <laughs> it's just, just a pretty strong, uh, strong smell. Let's put it that way. But anyway, let's give it a taste. Oh, damn. <coughs> oh. 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 <laughs> wow, okay, yeah. Oh. Oh, that, that'll that get your attention. <laughs> Let me try this again. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, what can I say? I don't know what kind of person would really enjoy this. It's uh, just kind of sweet and bitter. Uh, the ginger, I guess I taste some ginger in there, but it's just kind of uh, just kind of like a really uh, bitter and kind of sour taste to this. I'll try it again. I'm trying to be fair to this, and keep it in mind it's a wine, not an ale, so that could be throwing off my uh, taste uh, receptors a bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely not my cup of ale, shall we say. Um, you know, you definitely taste the ginger in there. It's kind of a, it's not a real spicy ginger, not a hot ginger. It's just kind of really a sweet, I and mean, then you get some kind of bitter flavors, a little bit of the, uh, I guess you taste the uh, the wine, the grape flavor. Uh, the ginger kind of comes in on the back end. You know, to be honest with you, this tastes sort of like medicine. <laughs> Your grandmother might have given you if you had a bad cold or something. Uh, yuck! <laughs> you know, I, I guess there might be people out there that love this stuff, but I'm definitely not one of them. I'm gonna have to go a zero out of five drinking <laughs> horns on this Stone's Original Ginger. You know, again, uh, tastes vary and everything, but uh, I definitely would not recommend this to <laughs> any of my friends. <laughs> or maybe I would. Uh, anyway, we'll go zero out of five on this. I mean, you know, it's not horrible. You could probably drink this, but I mean, man, there's so many more uh, pleasant beverages out there to, <laughs> to choose from. So anyway, zero for the Stone's original ginger. All right, what about the uh, the quote? Uh, so I was looking for quotes about independence and being independent and all this sort of stuff. And I found one from the uh, businessman Thomas J. Watson uh, that I, I really like this. I think you will too. Go something like this. Follow the path of the unsafe, independent thinker. Expose your ideas to the danger of controversy. Speak your mind and fear less the label of crackpot than the stigma of conformity. I love that. See you guys next week.
I can get you the exact oh, date. I don't of... wish to interrupt, boss. Then tightly don't. I wasn't talking to you. You were attempting to override a superior system. Be silent.